All right, so in this video, we're going to be beginning our coverage of the last chapter in the AP Physics C Mechanics section of the Barron's AP Physics book, dealing specifically now with universal gravitation, so how everything attracts everything else. And we'll be discussing the differences between little g and big G as they uh, pertain to our equations. Uh, we'll be looking at examples of Kepler's laws of planetary motion and how they govern how things move about our sun, as well as uh, a look into gravitational potential energy and the special way in which that's calculated. So we'll start off by basically defining the universal law of gravitation and it states that uh, all things with mass attract each other based on this equation right here, the force of attraction between objects 1 and 2 is this uh, gravitational constant g times the mass of the first object and the mass of the second object all divided by the distance between them r squared so you know you have object one object two and based on their different masses and this constant and the distance between their center of masses r uh, we can calculate the gravitational force of attraction between them and it should be noted that uh, g has a very specific value g is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 and then to make it consistent so that it's a force it has the units newtons meter squared per kilogram squared now that just gives us the magnitude mutually felt by these two objects uh, if you're looking for the vector force uh, then it's negative g m1 m2 over r squared because that's the magnitude times the vector r of object 1 to object 2 and it's negative because it points in the opposite direction the gravitational force on 2 points this way and the position vector relative to 1 points that way now most objects that exert a noticeable gravitational force are spherical so for example planets uh, comets suns, black holes, they all have a sort of spherical mass distribution due to the fact that it's the most efficient uh, surface area to volume ratio. But you can treat, if you have an object outside, like right here, you can uh, treat it as though all the mass of that huge object is at the center of mass. Oppositely, if you have, you know, a spot inside the object, so if you're inside the spherical mass distribution, all the force you feel can be treated as though you're above a sphere with this mass and this radius. So all the uh, mass above cancels out and you know you get all mass inside is what you feel from the force. So continuing now, having defined uh, our law of universal gravitation, we'll look more in depth at, you know, this idea of being inside a spherical mass distribution. And all you have to consider when you're inside a spherical mass is the sphere uh, that's below you of sorts. It's hard to define below because, you know, is this particle below you versus this one? Basically, uh, it's the sphere within you. And this is very easy to calculate if you have, you know, a uniform density. So for example, you know, rho, which is the spherical mass density, is mass per unit volume, and that will hold true for all the mass and volume uh, corresponding spheres within this distribution if it's uniform density, because rho always equals Okay. However, if you have a density function, rho as a function of the radius, then you have to sum up a bunch of different radial shells around the center to get the total mass of the system. Now we know that uh, volume equals 4 pi r cubed, and if you differentiate both sides, you get that the differential volume is 4 pi r squared dr. Now, we also know that rho is just dm over dv. 
So to get the differential mass, you multiply rho by the differential volume, and we can substitute this in. And because we have a function of rho in terms of r, we have everything in terms of r for this integral. And we get that rho of r times 4 pi r squared dr equals dm. From here, all you have to do is integrate both sides from you know, 0 to m and from 0 to whatever radius you're at. We'll call that r naught. And from here, you would simply, you know, integrate whatever this rho function was to find the total mass of the planet inside. And then from there, you could calculate the gravitational force inside of this imaginary sphere. Now moving on, we'll discuss the difference between little g and big G. And if you'll remember, we've been using the gravitational force uh, and approximating that in all our equations as F equals mg. And that's because for most of our problems, we've been treating uh, g as though we are you know, near Earth's surface. So what is in this little g term? Well, if we expand out, we can see that F equals the mass of whatever we're talking about times g. But g must be uh, something to complete the universal gravitation law you know, m2 r squared times g. So really, you have the mass of the Earth times the gravitational constant over the radius of the Earth squared. And because all of these are constants for all intents and purposes, I mean, the, the, radi the radial distance will change slightly as you go up or down elevation, but not significantly enough to affect the gravitational force you feel. We can approximate this whole term as that little g. And that's the acceleration at Earth's surface. Now that concludes our introduction to the law of universal gravitation. In the next video, we will look at Kepler's laws of planetary motion, specifically the, uh, the first three, as well as gravitational potential energy and how that's calculated.